Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 81 of the Stephen King Podcast. And I'm here with my usual partner in crime, Hollands. How are you doing? Hello, I'm fine. Great. And do you have any snow yet? Yeah, we actually got some snow, snow uh, today. Very little, but uh, there's some. Wow, we've had snow since Halloween, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was yeah, thinking you're further north, go- north, north than me, but I don't know. Yeah, we can go some winters with almost non, no, no snow at all. So, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's very different from year to year. Okay. Alrighty. So I think we can call this episode "Catching Our Breath" episode because we don't have a ton of stuff to talk about this time, and I think we've had a pretty busy six months. So actually, this is nice um, to actually sort of step back and smell the coffee, smell the roses, yep. or whatever it is you <laughs> like to smell. But. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and do that. We do have some news, and we are going to do a review of the King, Son, and Father collaboration, Sleeping Beauties. So if you haven't read that yet, there will be definitely spoilers for that section of the podcast, so you might want to leave that piece off. But as usual, the stuff in the news is just news, and it's not spoilers. So with that, let's start with the news. Welcome, welcome. Do not fear the door that lies before you. We will protect you. We are your guides, Hans and Lou, and we will give you the latest in Stephen King news. But before we do so, you must prove yourself worthy. You must open the door and join us in the death room. Yes, and first out in the news is something we almost already knew, but UK publisher Holler and Stutton has announced that they will release The Outsider on June 5th, same date as the US publisher. And they have actually released a cover that isn't supposed to be the finished cover because it, it uh, has the text cover to be revealed. But... Um, if you look at it, I think it's it's been too much work put into this cover for not being almost the finished cover. There might be some uh, small corrections to it, but I think this is very close to the finished thing that we will see. Oh, you do, do you? Yeah, I don't think yeah. they would change too much on this one. It looks finished, uh, I think. The the U.S. publisher also has a what's it called a filler or something like that, which is just uh, basically a mock-up of a cover to, to just a placeholder is what they call it. I think if you look at the US version, I think that that is more of a placeholder. It doesn't look as finished as, as this one. Okay. I might have to eat that up later. But <laughs> but I, th- I think this one is, if you look at it, it looks very nice. You have these boards and you have the text and it's mirror-wise on the boards and stuff like that. So I I would be the finished cover is, is very much different this maybe something smaller but i think this is basically what we're going to see all right i'll take your word for it you're you're the expert on uh, book covers i'm uh, if they say cover <laughs> to be revealed i don't know why they would put that on there but so we'll have to see yeah i i, I think they do it because they they might want to change some okay. stuff on it and so they don't want people to go out and say this is the cover and then they change it so but we'll see maybe they put up a totally different cover now just because i said like this right so. <laughs> yeah we well, should see. And uh, as you've mentioned yeah. before, you know, Detective Ralph Anderson, who is the protege of Andre Lanoge from Storm of the Century, or has the same name, that would be interesting to see. Yeah. If he's a shapeshifter, you would almost think that that character would be the character to be able to do something like that. But And again, mm. we'll s- still have to play with that title. And I think it has double meaning. And I'm hoping that we'll see Holly in this story as well. But uh, we yeah. shall see. Yeah. yeah, we don't know yet. All right, up next. Gwendy's. Button box. 
seems like a long time ago since this came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so much has happened. <laughs> but on October 31st, which has already passed, the book is now available in paperback for those of you who do not go the hardcover route. So you can get your copy at various locations, I believe. Amazon. Yeah, I think this one will be sold in bookstores as well. Probably Barnes and Noble and so forth and so forth. So if you're a collector of maybe first printings of hardcover and soft cover, then you want to add this one to your collection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes I have confirmed that they won't do this uh, this time, but sometime when they release a paperback, they include like a first chapter or a little teaser from the right. next upcoming book, which would be the outsider in this case. But this is not the case with this one. So you don't have to get it just because of that. But sometimes yeah. they do. So whenever a paperback is out and a new book is fairly close by you should have should make sure that you don't miss right that. i think that might happen with the paperback version of sleeping beauties but i'm not sure about this one but you, you could be right yep yeah okay and next up is the book shining in the dark which uh, i have uh, am the editor of and it's spreading around the world there will be the first edition that of this or is in the making is this uh, cemetery dance limited edition which i just got a early version of a couple of days ago and it looks really good so i'm, I'm very proud of that and we record this podcast on november 19th and tomorrow uh, november 20 the book will actually be released in paperback in bulgaria wow so uh, if you if you know bulgarian or or just collect every version of every book. Like you do. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you might want to look out for this one. And there will actually be a Italian version as well that will be released later next year. So that's a, an interesting uh, thing to see a book you've been involved in uh, released in, in different languages and I markets. Bet. So. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, you should yeah. be. It's. Uh, I guess it's the male equivalent, though. Don't take this comparison too far of having a baby i guess because you've been involved with this thing for so long <laughs> yeah. and it's really cool yeah, that you're getting yeah. it published in other languages and as we were talking before the podcast uh, hans was uh, kind enough to send me uh, an un a, an advanced copy of it and i uh, as i mentioned to him i love the fact that when he autographed it he spelled one word wrong which you know if you've been to a site <laughs> that occasionally happens because english isn't his first language but that just made it seem really yeah. personal from him so i really enjoy <laughs> that and Again, there's a fantastic collection of authors in this book that you know, Stephen King, Clive Barker, Campbell, Ketchum, Brian Keane, Lindquist, Richard Chismar. So there's a lot of really, a really excellent collection of authors here celebrating 20 years of Lilia's site. So I hope that and I wish you all the best success for that. And I think uh, the listeners out there will, should be chomping at the bit to get a hold of this book. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully you will do some kind of review of it later on. I think I, I'm too involved to sure. review it. Yeah, fairly, well, maybe, maybe uh, <laughs> next week or next week, <laughs> next podcast, we, we can, uh, I'll be glad to take that on. Whether you want me to record it separately from you or if yeah. you want to just hear my thoughts live, <laughs> uh, could be our last podcast together. I don't know, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, uh, I don't, I don't think, think so either. But uh, yeah, that, that should be a blast to do. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading it. It's on my, it's at the top of my TBR pile. I've got currently reading Joel Hill's Strange Weather. So once I get that done, then I will read this one and should have my review good to go for your next podcast, which should be in a couple of weeks. So congratulations again. And uh, once again, thank you very much for the copy of the book that you sent me. Yeah, my pleasure. All righty. So we don't have any movies in the theaters to report about or on Netflix, but we do have movie news. The first one is about It. That's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray and I assume 4K as well on January 9th. And it's too bad that they missed the holiday window on this one, but I'm sure it'll still be a big seller. So yeah, I actually think the 4K is, is released before Christmas. Oh, okay. I think I, I read that somewhere, and I don't know if they want to want people to buy that version because it's a new format, and they want to get that one out there first. Or I don't know why they release it in, in different on different dates. Yeah, well, I think that yeah, the digital format's out. I don't know if that's 4K or not, though. It may be. I don't know. Yeah. You know, besides the movie, there's some uh, pretty good special features on it. Uh, we get uh, Pennywise Lives, uh, discover how Bill Skarsgård prepared to portray the primordial creature known as Pennywise the Clown. Boy, that's a mouthful. Yeah. The Losers Club, you get a up a close personal with the teenage stars of it. 
uh, author of Fear. And this is uh, something that we hope for in almost every Stephen King disc, that we, but we don't often get. And I'm assuming, based on this description, this will actually be him. But yeah. Stephen King reveals the roots of his best-selling novel, The Nature of Childhood Fear, and how he created his most famous monster, Pennywise. And then we have deleted scenes. Then there's 11 deleted or extended scenes from the film. So that's, you know, that's a fairly respectable list of special features. I'm hoping maybe that there will be a commentary track with the machetes uh, as well. That's not shown here, but we can hope for that. Yeah. And it would be awesome if they did a commentary track with Stephen King, but I doubt if that will happen. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I doubt that as well, but it would be cool. I have to ask you, do, do you prefer it when the deleted scenes are separate or do you, would you prefer them to be put back in the movie just to have like a director's cut version of it? I guess, you know, it depends because maybe those scenes are alternate takes of the storylines that no longer work with the changes in the, in the final film. So mm. extended scenes, that's something I, I could be uh, definitely interested in. I mean, I like if we use Lord of the Rings as the model again here, uh, I always prefer the extended cuts of those movies over the, shorter theatrical release version and and it's weird because the extended cuts of those movies actually feel shorter because they flow better so i don't know even know if they can incorporate all these uh, extra scenes into the movie we don't know if they maybe they were discarded because they no longer fit the storyline that they had if they had an option where they had a non-kidnapping of beverly version mm, yeah I'd love that <laughs> <laughs> yeah how about you yeah same and one thing that I think on one level I would prefer it if they incorporate the scenes in the movie so we get like a complete movie. But on the other hand, is it's hard if if you have seen the movie on on at the cinema, and then the DVD is released like six months later, and you watch it with the scenes incorporated. It's it's not not always certain that you notice that it's uh, deleted scenes because you, you don't remember every scene exactly. So I think that is that is a better when they have it separately because then you know all the scenes and you have them all there and you can you can focus on, on the new stuff. So I don't know exactly what, what I want with them, if I want them incorporated or not, but I'm pretty happy with having them selected out so you can actually see the alternate version or the stuff that wasn't in the movie so you can keep them separate. Yeah, and branching branching versions would be the best, but uh, yeah. barring that, if they t- did two separate versions, that would work too. But yeah, I think for a movie of this length, they could do branching versions, and I know they've done that with like some movies like Terminator Two, which has been released so many times that mm. there was the branching versions as well of, of a longer cut. And I generally find myself liking longer cuts better, so we'll yeah. have to see how that plays out with this. Yeah, I actually I'm going to I'm going to reveal something now that's going to makes me make me look like a total geek. But Uh-oh. when uh, <laughs> in Sweden in the 80s and 90s and we had the film censors and uh, right. they were pretty hard on what they cut out of a movie and mm-hmm. sometimes the movies even were they they cut whole scenes so you didn't really understand what happening the movie was totally confusing. Right. So I actually, with a couple of Stephen King movies, and with a couple I mean more than I should, I actually sat with two uh, VHR players, two, TV, oh, yeah. two TVs, and actually played an uncut version and the Swedish version side by side to see what was cut in the movies. So I was uh, interested in seeing exactly what was cut. So right. uh, I actually did that, and, and uh, now that feels pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> no, I but, I can totally understand that, right? But it was interesting, and I mean, on on when you had VCRs and you didn't have the deleted scenes and right. stuff like that, so you had no chance of knowing. And you know that movies were cut here in Sweden because often they were like ten or fifteen minutes shorter right. than the original, so you know that stuff were cut out from it. But you you never know what. So that was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Does that still happen today? From time to time, but not as much. Right. Today, I don't think we have a, a government censorship now, uh, but we have we have oh. like grades for the movies. So sometimes yeah. the yep. movie company cuts them themselves to get like eleven years old into the movies and stuff like that. So sure, so yep. we have censorship, but not not as nearly as as much as we did in the eighties. It was it was horrible, yeah. horrible. 
Right. So I, one last thing, I, looking at the cover, I, I really like the cover that they're using for the for the disc too, with Georgie in the tunnel and the just a shadow of Pennywise in yeah. front of him curved up against the wall. I think that's a really evocative image of the movie. So whoever whoever chose that, they've pretty well nailed every aspect of this movie from the early teasing campaigns all the way through the marketing all the way up until the movie's release and that i think the only misstep that i ever heard was some people were disappointed that they had vr bus thing that you could go into Mm, yeah and i heard a lot of people were were not too impressed with that so but other than that whoever these people are in this movie that did the marketing and that they i I would if i was a filmmaker (laughs) definitely yeah yeah (laughs) my movies for sure the only problem now is the expectation of the second movie is huge so hopefully they can live up to that yeah and and i think everybody will agree that the adult part of the story is not as good as the children part of the story so I don't envy the machetes for for the second movie. I think there will be a very strong desire to include the kids in some way just to sort of yeah, evoke yeah. memories of the first movie. So we'll have to see how they handle that. But uh, I think, yeah, the yeah. second half is going to be a lot tougher. Okay, let's move on. And uh, the next one is actually something we heard before, and that is that there is going to be a remake of Pet Cemetery. Dennis Weidmeier and Kevin Kolsch is going to bring it back to life. We don't know much more about it, that they are going to do it. And we have heard this before, different people, different companies and everything like that. So I don't know if we should believe this too much until we know more. I think Pet Cemetery is one of those movies that have had most reputation for being remade. I don't know, maybe this is something that the company wants to doubt because the Machete siblings were talking about that they want to do it. So maybe they wanted to show the world that... It's taken already. I don't know, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. I think this is very light news that we shouldn't put too much much trust in. Yeah, I guess the machetes are out on this one. That's too bad. And the filmmaking duo of Dennis Widmer, Widmeyer and Kevin Kolsch, they did a 2014 thriller, Starry Eyes, which I'm just looking at on Rotten Tomatoes. 75% of the critics liked it, and they gave it a rating of 7 out of 10. But audiences only... 55% of the audience is like, and they give it a uh-huh. uh, rating of around 66%. So, I mean, they have some experience doing horror movies, which is always good. And hopefully that will, if they do do this, that will stead them well if they do Pet Cemetery, Because obviously we have the, mm. you know, the first movie, a lot of people like it. I I think it works in, a, in a, a certain areas and fails in others, but I definitely think that that movie could be remade today and uh, be even scarier. Though I don't, I don't know <laughs> if they'll ever get a cat as scary as yeah. the one that they had in the, the original movie. That's to me, is the freakiest cat in a horror movie ever. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so we'll have to see. Things can change until the, until the camera starts rolling. Who knows, uh, as we've yeah. often yeah. seen with these uh, announcements. So what do we got next? Okay, this is very, very interesting. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Marilyn Manson. (laughs) The shock shock rocker divulged in an interview with The Sun that uh, he is going to be acting for a Stephen King project. But he didn't divulge exactly which project that would be. So there's a lot of speculation at this point about what that could be and uh, this is the sun this is the the uk i'm assuming it's from uh from london because there's a lot yeah. of papers called the sun but this is from uh the the uk sun but this is a bit of stunt casting we don't know how big his part is and we don't know what project it could be i'm trying to think of what's being filmed next year for king and i doubt if the stand yeah. will be before the cameras next year yeah it could, could be the second it movie um it could be second it movie or um because he said movie, so if it, if we, we can't talk about TV shows, like he could be in the second season of Castle Rock, but yeah, but he said a movie specifically a movie. So. No, but I, in all fairness, he could be meaning a TV show and said movie anyway. So <laughs> right, but he said that next year we'll be busy acting in front of the Stephen King movie. So I mean. My guess is that it's not just a cameo, like in one episode of a TV show or something like that. Because, I mean, how long can that take to film? I mean, that's a couple of days, maybe. The way it's said here sa- implies that it will be something that will take up pretty much of his time. So I guess I guess from the thing that he said, I, I would assume that it's a bigger part. Who knows? Maybe you play Ben Hanscom in, this, in It. 
the grown up. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just guessing. No, I don't know who we would play. Yeah, I'm just looking through a list here of 2018 King mm. movies in development. It's an interesting list, actually, a lot more than I thought. Of course, these are all very, they're not they're not solid. They're, they, things could change, but they're saying The Stand, It Too, mm. The Talisman, Revival, Suffer the Little Children, uh, Drunken yep. Fireworks. That'd be interesting if he was in that one. Dr. Sleep. Yeah, and I mean... Firestarter. <laughs> I, I mean, most of those... I'm pretty sure will not be filmed next year. Hearts and Atlantis, no. Rose Matter, In the Tall Grass. So there, you know, there's quite a few. So I guess we'll wait and see. So interesting. I think it's, yeah, I think it's more stunt casting. It's interesting. Some people said uh, you know, in your comments that he looks like Mr. Barlow, which I mm. could, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely see that, but we're not heard of any remakes of Salem's Lot, so... No, no. It would be fun, though, if it was a movie that we hadn't heard about and it's just popping out. But uh, that's very unlikely right. today that that's going to happen. But it's, it's interesting. We'll just have to wait and see. Maybe someone out yeah. there knows and can tell us. Okay, let's move on. And the next one is also connected to movies, but it's about the soundtrack. That is that there's an 8 CD box released with soundtracks. It's from Dreamcatcher, Firestarter, The Stand, and The Shining. It's limited to 1,500 units, and it's designed to look like a paperback. So there's there's some book 24-page 20, booklet included. I'm not sure exactly what that booklet will, in, will include. I guess it's uh, information about the, the soundtrack or... Something like that, yeah. Probably, yep, the composers, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, um, what is your feeling about soundtracks? Well, it depends, again, on the project. I mean, I have I love the soundtrack from Lord of the Rings. I have the extended editions of all three movies, which is like about 15, 16 dicks, plus each set came with a high, high audio quality DVD audio disc version of the soundtrack. So, and I love soundtracks from Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Star Trek, the motion picture. I even have the complete set of soundtrack uh, titles from the uh, original Star Trek TV series, which is like on 18 discs. So I, I could say that, yeah, I, I'm, if I had to collect anything that I've collected more than anything else would be soundtracks. However, with Stephen King movies, I don't really find most of the soundtracks that memorable. So I'm I'm not really, really too hot on this set. I, I do love the soundtrack from uh, Shawshank Redemption. I do have that on CD. I think that's the only one really though. The other ones, I never really, there's nothing really there that grabs me to listen to them. Uh, I, I don't know how you feel about that. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm a, I'm a soundtrack fan. I mean, in the movie, once once music is in the movie, it it it's really important. So that's no 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 yes. discussion about that. In the movie, it's very important. But I I don't listen to that kind of music. I mean, I have I, I have a, quite a few CDs with soundtrack from Stephen King movies from back when I collected everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually even collected the soundtrack, but I. I can't say that I ever listened to them. I I listened to the ACDC track for Maximum Overdrive, but that's that's more like or don't fear yeah, the reaper I from mean, the stand. That's, no, that's but more that's like not... um, songs more than just compositions. I don't know exactly yeah. how to describe them, but if if there's songs like there was remember the one It's not an original soundtrack. Yeah, exactly. And the song that was on on the Dark Tower that was actually yep. a song. I I enjoy those, but when there's just music, I, I think that it doesn't mm -hmm. give me anything to just listen to them. They work fine in the movie, but to just listen on that, to them, uh, that's totally lost on me. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I can conjure up scenes from the movie. I mean, if you listen to the soundtrack from Shawshank mm -hmm. Redemption, I know exactly, and maybe because I've seen that movie so many times, but I know exactly what scene that piece of music is for. I mean, obviously, like the opera, you know, that's yeah. easy, but that opening track with the Welcome to Shawshank with the viol with the guitars, the, not guitars, violins playing, and then they should do that long tracking shot over the top of the, the roofs of the, the prison and then come down to where the bus is arriving. Mm -hmm. I know that. I know when the track for when 
Andy breaks out of prison and is raising his arms up in the air. So that that soundtrack, I I really like that soundtrack. But I think that's because I've watched that movie so many times. I've got that. It's kind of it's burned <laughs> in my jeans by now. Yeah. But other soundtracks outside, I mean, Shining a little bit, but you know, like Dreamcatcher uh, and Firestarter. I mean, I like the music, but that that's probably the oddest music that was ever chosen for a Stephen King movie. That Tangerine Dream soundtrack it just doesn't fit with the movie at all like it's <laughs> yeah i, I <laughs> you know, that's like music that i listen to when i want to try to go to sleep <laughs> yeah yeah i must confess that i i yeah. i don't think i could pick one song except fear the reaper from from the entire bunch from, from these four movies so yeah. yeah and that won't be on this that that's not uh that's not soundtrack music that's uh yeah so it won't that won't be in this uh, it might be uh, but I would I tend to doubt it. But the, you know the stand has a lot of good guitar music, right? I think it was Ry Cooter. Uh, so actually, that wouldn't be too bad to listen to yeah. um, if you've listened to something like if you ever played The Last of Us or something like that with that kind of guitar sound to it, uh, acoustical guitar stuff. I I, I I could see listening to that uh, for sure. I know that uh, we have one comment in, the, in our on your post from that, and that uh, Bryant Burnett says he's very excited about this. Uh, he, says he believes the price is good, and especially since The Shining has never been released before, plus longer versions of both Dreamcatcher and The Stands. Mm. So uh, then he says, "I hope they sell well, so they do another one." So we're going to put a challenge out <laughs> to you, Bryant. Get the soundtrack, listen to it, and then you should come on the podcast and uh, give us uh, your review of it. Yeah, so, definitely. Because that would be uh, that would be good to share with everybody else. So there you go, Bryant. Mentioned you, and uh, now the the glove's been laid down. So just hit us up with an email and let us yep. know if you want to. Great, come on. great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this last one is a fun one, Hans. Yes, this one is the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm laughing before I even talk about it. It's actually an, uh, in India, they made a version of it, but they didn't do it as a movie. They did it as a TV show that actually contained 52 episodes. Each episode was about 20 minutes long. So I think that would be like around 11 hours or something like that, I think. Yeah, so they have a added lot of, stuff. A lot of commercials. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually out there on YouTube if you want to look at it. It's called... Who, W O H, yep. or as you, Keanu Reeves says, "Whoa!" Yeah, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to check it out. But <laughs> and I mean, you are you are very happy, uh, lucky here, Lou, because if there were subtitles to it, I would force you to watch it and review it with me. But uh, oh, since <laughs> none of us, yeah, since none of us speak Hindi, and there's no subtitles to it, you're off the hook. But what everyone has to do is go to my site. Look at the news for October 30, and there's a YouTube clip that's just a few minutes, and it shows their version of when Pennywise kills Georgie. And I, I will say this, it, it, comes, it has a clown that looks more like a circus clown than a, than a monster. It has yeah. a swimming pool, <laughs> and it has a little kid, and I mean... I, I laughed so hard when I saw it. It is so bad, but it's so funny. Yeah. This is just one example. Uh, I actually managed to find the scene where where Beverly is back to her childhood home, and you know where the the old lady turns into her father. Right. From the from the original miniseries, and yep. here you have the same thing, but you have an old man turning into Pennywise, or as he called here, the Joker, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean the makeup on this old man it's so bad it's like they have put like glue on his cheeks and letting oh, it yeah. dry and you know how if you get glue on your fingers and it dries it it's just get wrinkling and it's like they have put that on his face to make him look look older and it's just like there's his old on spots <laughs> and then he's completely his face is young on the other side so I mean this this it's hilarious so even if you don't want to sit through all 52 episodes i think it's definitely worth checking out some scenes and hearing uh, the joker talk uh, it's it's uh, hilarious i wish it i wish it had subtitles i, I would definitely sit through it <laughs> cuz you're a glutton for punishment and somebody out there if you've got 
a version with subtitles. I don't want to hear about it because I don't want to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> but you have watched this scene, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. and it's hilarious. <laughs> yes, it is. And a lot of posts on your site about this one. And apparently there was other adaptations done, one on Misery and another on Quitters, Inc. So, yes, I have actually uh, looked a little bit about uh, on, the, on the one Misery. Right. Uh, and uh, it's uh, just as bad. And that's that's okay. actually released on DVD with subtitles. So, yeah. who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't want to know. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> All right. So that's the news. Yes. This is great. What's our job? We'd like drive around, pick up stiffs, or what? It's time for reviews from the night shift. We're down to actually talking about books again, and we only have one book written by two authors. So I guess you could say roughly for this, what is it, about 800 pages? I guess, oh, 700. So you could say that uh, half 350 pages of its own King and the other 350 is Stephen King. But what the story is called, Sleeping Beauties, which is a fantastic title, and that's a very simple premise, and yells usually make the best stories. Notice I said usually. Sleeping Beauties is a story about where all the women in the world fall asleep. And during the book tour, Stephen and Owen King went to great lengths to talk about their writing process of this book. And they mentioned that they basically rewrote each other's pieces so that they developed what they called a third voice. And I guess my question to you, Hans, did that third voice work for you as well as it did if it was just Stephen or Owen King writing on their own? It's difficult. I think that Stephen King's own voice is more appealing to me. But I think that it it was interesting to me to read this book and hear, because I think I heard this third voice, actually, and it wasn't, it wasn't King, I almost said, but it wasn't Stephen and it wasn't Owen. But I think they managed to get the, this third voice. I think for this story, it worked pretty good. Okay. I don't think I would prefer it over Stephen King's own voice, but um, mm, interesting. For, for once in a while, uh, I could definitely enjoy it. Okay. I take it you. I take it you didn't. I enjoyed it, but I just thought it could have been better. And I, I think that the biggest problem I had with this book is there wasn't really any surprises. Like, mm -hmm. didn't you find that you knew exactly how the story was going to end before you actually got to the end of the book? I knew that the women were going to come back and there was some mild drama about whether or not the tree was going to get destroyed or not, but it pretty well played out the way that I thought the story was going to play out. And that was kind of disappointing. Like the best books are the ones where you go, at the end it says, wow, I never saw that coming. But then when you're done and you think about it, you says, but really, how else could the story have ended any other way than the way that it did end? But it was an ending that you didn't expect. So my problem with this book is that the story was predictable. Mm. So I wasn't surprised by anything in it. I, I don't know. Did you did you ha uh, have any feelings about that, or did you encounter that? It didn't have that much surprise in it, but I can't say either that I know exactly what was going to happen. I was interested to see how they were going to solve everything, because it was quite supernatural. Uh, this uh, other world and the, the tree and the fox and everything like that. So even though it, it it wasn't a surprising book. I, I didn't see it all coming. I think. I think. I think it was more of a of a feeling is about how are they, how are they going to solve this in a believable way? Right. Uh, because the story in itself is quite unbelievable. Uh, right. I mean, or not realistic. So my hope was that they were going to solve it in a way that I could accept and not too strange if that makes any sense. And did it? So, yeah, I think I think it did. And I think that I like that when the woman... Uh, I, I mean, the question was for the women, should they go back or should they stay? Right. And even though I suspected they would go back, uh, I I think they they made a point that it wasn't... It wasn't certain that, that they would, and it wasn't certain that all the women would, w women would want to go back. And I and I liked the way that when they did go back, not not all, everything for everyone ended happy. Some some, <laughs> I mean, some of them should probably have been better off if they would have stayed on the other side. Yeah. 
I figured you were going to say that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, for for some of the women, going back was the wrong wrong decision, and for some it was the right. And I, I think that was something that I liked because you know me, I don't want everything to just lay out in a good way and and everything going to fix itself. Right. So I, I think it was it was interesting to see that even though they did the made this, the choice that we were expecting them to to make. We also saw that for everyone, that wasn't the right de- decision to make. All right. So I, I enjoy that aspect of it. Okay. So, and this is probably unfair uh, because one book has been around for so long and it's, it's probably his best book of all time. But my problem, the other problem with this book is there's a lot of characters that I didn't care about. Whereas in The Stand, mm. uh, every character was interesting to me in some way. In this book, there was a lot of characters that I just didn't really care about. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I think I think the problem was that this book maybe had too many characters. Yeah. They weren't all needed. I mean, they could have told the story and involved fewer characters. And by by including so many, I think you you, you didn't really as you say, you didn't care about everyone because they they weren't really necessary. Or they were so broken to begin with that you knew that they would never change. So yeah, that, yeah, that their their story arc was flat. They ended up being the same person they were at the be ending of the story as they were at the beginning. Yeah, so I definitely think they could have limited it and removed a couple of characters. And speaking of characters, this is also the first book I think where we get a list of characters in the beginning of the book. Yes, and I wonder why they had to do that. Yeah, that I, because they were people were getting confused when they read the story. Yeah, I, I felt the same. I thought that it would be a, would be a more complex uh, story uh, with all these characters because of the list of characters in the beginning. But I, yeah. I, I think I, I didn't think I maybe once I get go, went back and check who that character was. But I, I, other than that, I don't think I used the the list of characters. So I'm not sure why they included that included that one. Yeah, I, I was the same as you. I think there was one character I had set to go, uh, I'm not sure who this is because I don't think they've been in the story for like 300 pages or something like that. So I had to go back and look up, who's this person exactly again? So, yeah. I mean, I want to be careful here because I, I, I'm sounding pretty negative about the story and I I enjoyed reading it. But at, when I finished it, I, my initial reaction is, well, I'm glad I read it, but I don't think I'll ever read the story again. I mean, there's nothing in there that is there anything in that story that makes you want to read it again down the road? Yeah, I think I, I think I want to read it again because I think it was an, as we talked about earlier, the the third voice. I think that was interesting because I tried to see who who wrote what and couldn't really right. decide. I think it was interesting of that aspect, and that really didn't have much to do, to do with the story itself, but. I, I tried to to find King's voice or Owen's voice, but didn't really succeed. And I I think for that reason, I would like to read it again and and see if now that I have read the story once, if uh, I could focus more on the on the voices and see if I could could discover who wrote what. Right. And but I don't know. Maybe that's not possible to do since they rewrote each other so many times. So they might have yeah. lost the original voice somewhere in there. But I think. I liked I liked the fact that we had this small town and I liked most of the characters actually even though not like the stand where you really care about them but I I still liked them and uh, I think they were good uh, characters but I think that they should maybe have left some of them out and focused more on on the ones that, that were left because I think there in some scenes there were too many characters and then more than we needed to have there but yeah, I can definitely see myself reading this one again. Uh, that's interesting. I would. Uh, it'll be a, it'll be a while before, <laughs> before I, <laughs> I, I want to tackle it again. Who were your favorite characters? I I like, and they weren't in the story very much, but just because they were so funny, as the two brothers that got the bazooka and started blowing everything up. <laughs> yeah, they were they, they were kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, I like those two as well. And and Lila, I guess, or Lila. I was going to yeah. say Lilia, but Ly- Lila was, she was pretty good. Yeah. And the old guy as well. But there's a lot of characters. They were just, okay. Yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I like to remember her name now, but the, the police officer that uh, the went after, after. Yeah, exactly. The, that went after the brothers. Yeah. I can't remember her name right now, but I liked her. 
Right. And uh, Lila as well. I think she she was a, a great main character. Yeah. I actually enjoyed her husband Clint as well. Yeah, he was kind of a wet noodle to me. I he's okay. <laughs> but... He wasn't. If if I this way, he wasn't. The the character itself wasn't that likable. But I liked how they created him or and how they described him. Yeah. If that makes any sense, I think they they portrayed him in a very good way. But maybe he wasn't the character you loved and and rooted for. Uh, all the time. Yeah, he, you can understand where he why he was what he was. Yeah. Did you find the whole thing with Lila and did you find the whole thing about her thinking that that girl was his daughter? That, that was like she's a sheriff. She should have been a lot sharper than that. I found that I don't know contrived. Like sh- just because this girl did this handshake thing, that was like I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. It's, I just didn't buy that uh, that 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 Lila would be that dumb. No, I. It's, it was like she was looking for something, right? Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that as as time went on, I put a lot of these logical things that she did right. on that fact that she was extremely tired and really didn't uh, make the best decisions. It's almost like I actually enjoyed her quite well as well. The the cop that was back at the station who walked around with a computer and watching those uh, YouTube videos to keep awake, stay awake. Oh yeah, yeah. I I kind of liked her as well, and I felt very a lot of pity for her going around there watching YouTube to stay awake. And <laughs> I yeah, mean, and then she gets blown away. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, she she didn't want to want to go to sleep because she didn't know if she was going to die. But I mean, how fun is life if you go around in circles <laughs> watching YouTube all the time? I mean, <laughs> yeah, she was she was uh, in a in a very sad place. But I I I like that character as well. Yeah. I also had a logical problem with the story in that if the women had decided to stay, I mean, there was one boy, but I don't think that would be enough for them to survive themselves either after they all started to get older in that, right? I think they would have, a lot of them would have died off and there maybe would have been a handful of them left, but then unless, you know, they had all boy babies or something like that, and there's no way they could do like genetic selection yeah. of, so that just kept on thinking, why they don't, they can't stay there either. They're all going to die off. So both worlds are going to die off. So... It didn't really make a lot of sense. What I what I think the, some of the novel's strength was the portrayal of how men approach problems versus how uh, women approach problems. I, th- I think that was mm. pretty well done. So I, I enjoyed that. But I just circle back to my bit, you know, the thing I started off with. I just didn't find anything surprising in the story. Uh, it pretty well went exactly where I, where I knew it was going to go. And any of the obstacles that they threw up were nothing really major that uh, was hard to overcome. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the things that that threw me off a little bit is that, I mean, it it the men deteriorated pretty quick. I mean, it it wasn't many days until they started fighting, and I mean, it was almost like just because all the women disappeared, we men turned back to being apes in in just a couple of hours. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> I, I actually bought that, but oh cause, yeah, cause I think I think I think women really keep men in check a lot of the time. <laughs> Well, you're Canadian. That's what I'm talking about human nature, right? Like, well, yeah. I think that's the strength of the book. Yeah. Um, you're Canadian and I'm Swedish. That's. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to touch that. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I, I see what you mean, but I think that in some retrospective, it, it, it some, sometimes it went too fast. People were, the men were at their, each other's throats very quickly. And, um, but then when you it, take something away from a guy, they usually get pissed off a lot quicker than a woman does. Yeah, yeah, they do. I agree to that. But uh, again, generalize, yeah. generalize statement. <laughs> Don't take that to heart. <laughs> no, I, I didn't have a problem with that. I, I think it was. I think it was showing that men take a lot of things for granted, and when that those things are taken away, I don't think they react in a any in a way that's superior to uh, how uh, women handle things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. just my opinion. Please don't send me hate mail. <laughs> it's just my life observations that a lot of times when you see older couples, if the man passes away first, the women usually recover from that a lot quicker than opposed to where if the wife passes away, the men usually have a lot harder time recovering from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's I don't know true. if you've noticed that. Yeah, but, that's, uh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And, and one thing that I like with this book, I don't know if that's the the book's strength or if it's the publishing department but going into this book i i felt i didn't know all that much 
I mean, we had had some shorter excerpt from it. Right. But I think those were very, very different from each other, and they didn't really give away too much. I mean, we know that the women were going to sleep and what would happen when they didn't wake up. But I, I think it was fun to go. I mean, with other books, we tend to know more. I don't know if that's based on what they give us in descriptions of, of the plot or stuff like that. Right. But I felt with this book, for the first time in a very long time, I actually went into a new Stephen King book knowing almost nothing of of the plot except that the women were going to go to sleep. So I th- I think that was very refreshing. Yeah, that that's the big question mark of the story, is where d- what happens to the women when they're asleep, and what we yeah. find out. I don't know. It it just didn't really grab me that much. So they're in an alternate reality that's in the future, and everything's broken down in that. So, but why why did that? Why did they go there? Why not to like the Garden of Eden or? Mm. Yeah. Or something like that. And like Eve wasn't really, she wasn't really explained either as to why she came. Like what was just general dissatisfaction with men <laughs> or, or the or the way the world is being treated. Or like I didn't really understand her motivations properly either. So no, no. maybe that's part of the problem I'm having with that. She just seemed like a very, she was just a little too mysterious. Like at some point she should have said, this is why I'm here. And how i'm here and like she 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 did say why she was there but how did she get like how did she get there like uh, in the real world yeah, like what yeah. brought her back into the real world like what was the trigger or or is she working on her own or is she representing somebody else or is she representing earth mother earth uh, i just found that part of the story it just wasn't fleshed out enough for me to make me really engrossed by what what was taking place in the in the other world with the women like that whole section where they are going to that doing some hiking and we're exploring and they go into that jail and whatnot and it it slides down the hill and all like like why was that in the story yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like like that whole thing could have been cut out and not made of any difference right is it just to show us that they can get killed in that world we already knew that because of if, if men start uh, burning the cocoons and that these these women disappear in the other world so it, it just yeah. the whole story just didn't really it wasn't developed enough to really get me fully interested in and understand exactly what was happening I, I don't know if you had that problem yeah the big why was never answered yeah so uh, that could definitely be, be had been explained why they were going there and why why not anywhere else and what the purpose of them going there who who wanted them to stay there and who didn't so mm-hmm. there's a lot of and questions why did about, this one town represent the whole world like what about all the other women that are in that dreamland like if they would have taken a vote maybe they would have lost <laughs> yeah yeah you know like they were deciding for the whole alternate reality like which doesn't seem that seems like a very man thing to do i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that but that would have been uh, if if not there would have been even more characters and uh, the book would have been much uh, thicker yes so. i understand i understand from a story telling point of view but from a character mindset, um, I don't think that they would have been comfortable speaking for everybody, every woman in the world. Um, yeah. So, but but who knows? Anyhow, so that so that it's just you know like the, those kind of unanswered questions just kept detracting from my enjoyment of the story. Yeah. I mean, I love the concept, uh, and actually, I think the story would have worked better if we didn't even never knew where the women were. <laughs> yeah, if they <laughs> were just disappearing. Yeah. Yeah, if they were just. And it would have been a different mechanism to to get them back, but uh, but I think yeah. that actually would have worked better. This whole alternate reality and the wolves and the lions and this or tigers and the tree thing it was like I said, it wasn't all like they're symbols, but they didn't it it didn't really. I don't know. Maybe it's just my lack of comprehension of what they were trying to say in the story that uh, that's why I had difficulties with it. I, I didn't understand all those parts of the story. Yeah. So it didn't work like the stand, you know, it's a, it's a virus. It's going to kill everybody. People that are left, you've got good versus evil. Like that's a pretty straightforward to understand story. This Mm. one was on the same scale, but the mechanics about why things were the way they were was never fully explained satisfactorily to me. Yeah. You know, what would have been really interesting is that if Stephen and, and Owen would have written one book each and they would both cover the same story but one would have been from the men's perspective and one would have been from the women's 
And well, they, then they should have got a woman writer, like maybe Tabitha or Owen's wife or something like that to do that. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it would have been interesting if they would have split the, this book in two and one would would go through every event, but only from the man's point of view and only from this reality. And the other one would have just shown the women's perspective and only from this other place where they were. And you could right. read the books after each other. And when you read the second book, you would, ah, that's when that, that happened in the first book is happening and it gets these reactions here. That would have been cool. And they could have sold them as a set. So you, you had to get both books, but it would have been divided. That would have been an interesting twist, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, you yeah. can pitch it to them. Maybe they can do it as a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we could edit it, uh, edit the book in two and, and just... <laughs> yeah. <Read> it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but any other thoughts? Yes, we have one thing, and I don't remember if knew if you remember, but I said that we should pick our favorite book. We picked our favorite movie uh, last time, and okay. now that we have reviewed both books for 2017 and both our col uh, collaborations, Sleeping Beauties or Gwendy's Bottom Box, which one is your favorite? Stephen King 2017 book. So, Sleeping Beauties, Gwendy's Button Box. Was there anything else? That was it, right? Uh, Charlie, Charlie the Choo Choo, but I don't think that counts really. Yeah, no. So that's the two. That's interesting uh, because when we talked about Gwendy's Button Box, I had the question about what exactly was Flag up to in that story because I guess, that story was felt I felt like the other shoe never dropped. Yeah. Or there's there's another half to that story that we need, and I would like them to write that other half of that story. And this one, as I just said, I I just didn't find it uh, surprising. So I, I would have to go with Gwendy's button box, even though I had that big question. The actual story itself, I, I liked the characters in that story, and it felt more like a King book than this one did too. So yeah, I'm gonna say Gwendy's button box. Yeah, I'm actually gonna agree with you on that one. So all right. Yeah, I think yeah, I think. <laughs> This, the, those are def, this, the books are totally different. I mean, both in uh, length and uh, style and everything. But what really made a difference for me is, as you pointed out, when this bottom box is more of a Stephen King book than Sleeping Beauty. So I think that that's the one that made uh, the thing that made me enjoy that one more. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's like when King worked with Richard Chismar, they still ended up sounding like a, a story that sounded like a Stephen King story. But when two Kings worked together, they tried so hard not to sound like each other that they didn't sound like Kings a lot of the time either. So I don't know. Yeah, It's a, it's a definitely a mixed bag experience for me. I love the premise. I just guess, as I said, I just didn't like the execution because it didn't surprise me really in any way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think also what one of the reasons that when this bottom box is more like a King book is that I think that, King and uh, Shismar are more the same, have more the same style than Stephen and Owen because I don't know if you read any of Owen's book, but I've read Double Feature. Yeah, I've read it. That one is is very far from a Stephen King book, so I think that they are very different in their styles of writing, and I think that when you mix those two styles up, I don't think that it, it's possible to get to one of their styles. It, it has to be something in between, and, and that is what we got. I agree, 100%. Yeah. But definitely you should check out both books if you haven't. They are both good reads, but you have to pick one that's your favorite, yeah, and there's, this time it's what's yeah. going this. There's definitely delight, delightful sections of uh, Sleeping Beauties. There's some really funny stuff, and there's some really insightful stuff, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, that is it for this episode. Remember to go watch... Whoa. Um, or at least uh, Georgie scene. Um, you are going yeah. to thank us after you did. Uh, yeah, it... and the link's up at your site yes. on the post, so yes. check it out. Yeah. Next time, we really don't know what we're going to be doing, but hopefully we'll have some interesting stuff for you. Well, we do have Strange Weather we could review. Yeah, we definitely have that one. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. worth a, a review. And I don't know if you want to do the review for your book next episode or if you want to wait a bit uh, that's up to you I, I don't know what your timing is on your marketing and that so no uh, i think that if, if you're up for it you can definitely do it next time okay 
Yep. There we go. So we've got our show. Number 82 is all lined up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Until next I time. I think it's your, yeah, it's your, your time to, or your turn to say the, to say the lines. So yeah. go ahead. Before we say line, I have to comment. We have gotten some questions or I have at least if, if we make this up, all the mistakes we do and then we sign off, but we are totally uh, focused on trying to get it right, but we fail each time. <laughs> oh, really? So, People actually asked you about that, did they? Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no. So it's not something we, we, we do. We're not that good at actors. No, we do our best, <laughs> but we fail miserably every time. <laughs> no, not every time. No, not every time. You know, often enough. Yeah, and, often uh, enough. But we, we also own up to them, so that's... Yeah. So, until next time, go ahead. Stay safe. But stay scared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we nailed cool. it this time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See, sometimes we get it right. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>